Oh, okay, fine. Someone is recording. That's fine. Good. So, uh, welcome you all. Uh, on behalf of uh, Team Prep Medico and Prep FRCS, I am Manikandan Kadarpel. Um, I'm the uh, program director for the Prep FRCS. And as I told you before, um, we, uh, as a team of uh, 15 surgeons from UK, we have been uh, doing the FRCS courses for the last two years. And uh, our course is kind of a unique form of a course, which is like, unlike the regular intense course, ours is a kind of a mentorship program along with Viva training, which happens over a period of three months, um, um, uh, just before the uh, usual schedule of the JCIE exams. Um, we conduct sessions over the weekend. Um, we try to give uh, more importance to one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentoring. Um, and um, as most of you know, most of you here have registered for our course. Our main course starts on June 11th, 2023. And this event is happening as a part of um, our main course um, as a taste of Viva sessions. So um, last week we had um, general surgery taste of Viva sessions. And this week we are planning to discuss some critical care scenarios. Um, before that, I want to give an update about the uh, recent uh, exam which happened uh, last week. So the the uh, the May uh, uh, FRCS exams which happened, uh, which finished day before yesterday. There were many expected scenarios and many very, very unexpected scenarios which came, okay? Usually in the FRCS exams, um, how much ever you prepare, there will be one or two scenarios uh, which will surprise you, OK? Um, for example, in February 2023 exams, uh, one of the long case for the general surgery was a shoulder sarcoma, OK? Which which really means uh, the candidates were struggling, but uh, it, it was a completely an unexpected scenario. Similarly, this time, um, the scenario uh, which the candidates had for one batch which had for general surgery was a patient who had underwent multiple breast surgeries with multiple flaps for a breast cancer. And all the questions were surrounding this. What are the indications of flap? When will you give chemo, radiation, this and that, this and that, which was a complete shock to me, OK, to be very, very honest, because uh, as per the um, syllabus, as per this the the knowledge is required um, for let me the that, knowledge that would be great for me uh, yeah. <laughs> the knowledge required the knowledge required for a non breast trainee uh, for this uh, exam is um uh, is up to st4 level and i don't think st4 level uh, would be uh, would include these uh, flaps and stuff but so the thing is, what I'm trying to tell is, you can expect anything in the exams, OK? And um, the the key point is, in your specialty, you should be the boss. That's the level you need to prepare yourself. In all other specialty, you should be able to know um, to an extent of ST6 level, I would say. Although it means upper GI and colorectal uh, uh, it's the specialties are expected to be at a level of ST6 for all trainees and other specialties like transplant, breast, endocrine and vascular is at a level of ST4. But I would advise you, advise every one of you to have a knowledge equivalent to ST6. Considering these um, uh, surprises which happens now and then, we have changed a few things in our course. Uh, although our course is mainly focused on uh, delivering Viva and the teaching through Viva. And we have very few teaching or lecture sessions like a colorectal symposium and academic um, uh, uh, paper interpretation and stuff like that. This time, we are planning to introduce um, specific lectures uh, for uh, breast surgery specifically to all the trainees and non-trainees. We are also planning to introduce upper GI um, a lecture for everyone just to build up their basic knowledge. Similarly, we are going to give uh, a lecture on transplant as well. This is all the new additions which we are planning um, to incorporate in the course, uh, which has not been put up in the schedule so far. Um, but 
uh, these things were happening and quite a few of the candidates were very very uh, upset with the kind of scenarios this is in terms of scenarios on the other side in terms of the examiners as we usually expect you will have a, a very cool examiner and at the same time you might have a very difficult examiner okay and apparently few of the candidates felt that few of the examiners were very very difficult and they felt uh, they felt difficult to sail through the uh, scenarios uh, but uh, again uh, and this was the feedback given by our old course candidates but what i want to tell you that is uh, you will expect both kind of uh, uh, examiners in your exam okay so you should be able to face any kind of examiner whether they are cool or very harsh or very um, what to say stubborn or not accepting your answers and you should develop the habit of not taking the emotions of that scenario to the next scenario that's the most important thing which you need to um, uh, learn uh, when you are preparing for this exam okay and it's not always that all the difficult examiners um, uh, are very harsh in giving uh, marks also we don't know there are many situations where the harsh examiners will give you although they they are harsh during your scenario but they will give you a lot of marks but the, the very cool examiner might fail you so we don't know okay so these are the two important feedbacks which we got from the candidates okay and we are also planning for another session once the results are out most likely by next week we'll have the results uh, which will come out at the point we are planning to have a get together session with the past candidates and candidates who, who are appearing for the exams to have an interactive session which we will uh, let you know so this is all which i want to tell you guys and without probably wasting time we will probably uh, proceed to the viva okay and as i um, put up in the group i am not going to uh, ask for who wants to answer but i'm going to just go with whoever has told yes in the group unfortunately the number of yes has come down over a period of time it was initially more it is slowly coming down i don't know why anyway let me start the youtube channel oh is it because of the youtube channel okay <laughs> No, it's uh, that's fine. So sorry about that, guys. It's 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 just just used for you know academic purpose. Okay, that's fine. So in my uh, list, I have Noor uh, Jaril Nabi. Are you here? Okay, not here. Mohammed Motovia. Shall we start with you, sir? Yes, I'm here, but I'm having a problem with my camera. I'm trying to get myself on, but uh, this but, isn't working but, as, I, as it should. That's fine. No, you're problem. not missing anything. I don't look any good now. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. So, Mohammed. So, we are going to discuss critical care sessions, and I am not going to stress you with in terms of timings. Okay, but I'll be just questioning you, and don't get stressed. And you can the the aim of this is to just understand how the questions are. Okay. Fine. Sure. So, you have started your job today as a consultant general surgeon. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you were registrar. Okay, is calling you in the night when you are at home, telling that there is a 28-year-old boy, okay, who was brought to the A&E mm -hmm. following a road traffic accident, okay, four-wheeler versus a two-wheeler, okay. This particular patient was driving on the two-wheeler, okay. Was so the right? patient driving the two-wheeler. This particular patient right. who was brought in was in the two-wheeler, okay. Mm -hmm. The the patient's GCS, okay, on the at the site of trauma, okay, was uh, fourteen by fifteen, okay. So the patient is brought to the A and E, okay, and the trauma call was put out, okay, and your registrar is calling you before seeing the patient. Mm -hmm. How will you approach the situation? Right. Okay. Um... The registrar hasn't seen the patient, which makes the information that will be relayed to me very limited. Mm -hmm. um, I think it really comes down to the situation in the hospital. Am I on site or off site? You, you are off site. Uh, so I will ask the I will ask the registrar to prioritize uh, going to see this patient uh, with the trauma team with the trauma mm -hmm. call, mm -hmm. and um, find out exactly what's happening and call me back as soon as possible. This is the first thing, but uh, obviously when in this conversation, I will just highlight things that he needs to pay attention to, like uh, 
if this patient, uh, I, I will um, just highlight that if the patient. So this here, particular registrar, again, this is his first job in the UK. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he is so anxious to approach the situation. So what are you going to tell him? What all you want? We will ask him to initially assess the patient. Of course, I will. Uh, I will ask him to uh, do it um, in the uh, follow the uh, ATLS uh, guide, uh, ATLS algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure that the C spine is uh, is fixed. Uh, make sure that his air, the patient's airway is open, uh, breathing spontaneously. I hope as his GS is fourteen, um, and um, uh, with with the breathing, also make sure that he's not in tension pneumothorax or anything of the uh, causes that could compromise his breathing. Uh, from the circulation point of view, I want to make him. I want to make sure that he's stable. So I will want numbers uh, in terms of his heart rate, his uh, blood pressure. Uh, make sure that he. Fine. Is That's fine. So you 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 have told the initial list to the registrar. Registrar has gone down to see the patient. He is quickly seeing the patient. Patient uh, is gasping to breathe. So the A and E doctors have intubated the patient. Okay. Right. And. Okay. And um, his heart rate is 120. Mm -hmm. Okay, blood pressure is 60 by 40 millimeters of mercury. Right. Okay, your registrar is panicking. It's a district general hospital where there is only an ortho registrar and a general surgery registrar alone is there. He is calling right. you, telling that the heart rate is 130, blood pressure is 60, 40. Okay, so um, in this situation, I think. Uh, it's not reasonable to manage this from a distance. I think I need to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. I will be in touch with the a &E consultant, make sure that he is aware of what's happening, that the registrar is new, that if there is any surgical intervention, uh, if he's able to realize it. So because his low heart, low blood pressure and the gasping for air, this could be tension pneumothorax. The a &E, I hope, I would hope that the consultant a &E is able to put a chest drain if my registrar is not trained enough overseas to do it. Um, and obviously, I, I want to identify why is he shocked. So why do you want to put a chest drain? So in this patient's airway, the patient was gasping to breathe, okay, but they have intubated. And uh, obviously, once they have intubated, they would have assessed the chest air entry. Yeah, Unless yes. the air entry is less, you don't suspect tension pneumothorax, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Yes, of course. But uh, it, uh, so it, it, I will need to know more information about the chest expansion, so, uh, the air entry on both sides. Is it equal? Uh, is there a distant um, like uh, heart rate, uh, distant heartbeats uh, on auscultation? Um, possibly if the patient had portable X-ray at that time or not, I would like to so know. So this patient's blood pressure is 60-40. What could be the other reason for his blood pressure? Um, if it's not tension pneumothorax, if it's not uh, cardiac tamponade, it would be bleeding somewhere. So, do uh, you think? Do you think um, this patient, um, when the blood pressure was 60 40, uh, you asking them to assess whether this is all happening in the chest? Is it appropriate or inappropriate? What is going to kill the patient first? Whether it's a tension pneumothorax or is this hypotension? Um, I would say tension pneumothorax. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would say that we uh, finding the blood pressure 60 over 40, mm -hmm. I would assume that someone has, uh, I, I would assume that the trauma team has activated the major hemorrhage protocol and started two wide bore IV mm -hmm. uh, IV lines on both uh, anticubital. Fine. That's factor. okay. So and you so, told something called uh, major hemorrhage. How do you define major hemorrhage? Uh, major hemorrhage is uh, if the patient loses uh, uh, what's equal to sorry so if the patient loses uh, blood at a, at a rate more than 150 mils per minute mm -hmm. or uh, losing uh, half of his blood volume um, in 4 hours or his full blood volume in 24 hours but okay. this is this is more of major major transfusion as well how do you define massive transfusion massive transfusion is uh, transfusing half of the blood volume uh, in four, four hours or the total blood volume in uh, 24 hours. Are you aware of any number of blood units which is put up in this definition? Um, Based on the number of blood units. I am not sure, but I think four, four units in, in four That's hours. Fine. So by this time you reach the hospital, okay? Mm -hmm. By this time you reach the hospital, they have, as you thought, patient was started on first some crystalloids and then they gave some 
O negative blood, okay? okay. They have given a unit of blood and patient's blood pressure is still 60, 40, okay? Okay. What will you do now? Um, has the patient had fast examination? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, so I will I will uh, start obviously examining uh, examining the patient, uh, mm -hmm. getting uh, history, ample history, and examining the patient. And when I say examining, patient is intubated already. You can't get an ample history. Um, are there any relatives around? No. Okay. So I will start with the examination. I will make sure that the uh, cervical spine and ABCD have been done uncovered and exposure. Make sure that there are no open uh, wounds or any signs of bleeding anywhere. Uh, I will um, uh, ex examine the chest, examine the abdomen, see if there is any sign of distension. Okay. You examine the abdomen. The abdomen is distended, okay? Mm -hmm. And there is no ultrasound scan machine, unfortunately, available in the a a &E, and you okay. think that the patient is bleeding what will you right. do now um, so if the blood pressure is 60 over 40 if it if he's transient respondent or non-respondent this is an indication to take him to theater i don't but, think he's fit he, he's before he's, that um 60, 40 you want to initiate anything you will you just take the patient to theater um, I I assume that the major hemorrhage protocol has already been uh, it, uh, it, it is your call isn't it yeah right okay so i will initiate the major hemorrhage protocol first. okay so now can you tell me so you you want to initiate the major hemorrhage protocol in yes. your hospital how are you going to initiate it who is the lead person on this who controls all these things um i would say it is the trauma team but if someone in person it would be the surgeon mm -hmm. but uh, i'm not sure about this information Okay, so what is major hemorrhage protocol? Major hemorrhage protocol is when there is a massive bleeding uh, happening with the patient. Uh, we raise the major hemorrhage protocol to let all the uh, involved teams and involved specialties that can help stop bleeding uh, be around. And most importantly, the uh, blood bank to ensure that we have a cross-matched uh, bloods for the patient or provide O negative bloods. Okay, what is the difference between you asking the blood bank, uh, telling that the patient is bleeding, give me six units of blood? Mm -hmm. What is the difference between asking for six units of blood and initiating a major hemorrhage protocol? Um, the, 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 um, I think the cross-matching process, they will use the abbreviated cross-matching, so it should take less time. To provide mm -hmm. or provide the O negative, um, O negative blood that will that will uh, that will be just looking for the, the cross matching or the uh, the cross matching will be just to look for anti for antibodies. Um, well, I I pass. I'm not sure. That's okay. Fine. So if you ask for a major hemorrhage protocol, okay, you have initiated. Okay, so someone runs to the blood bank and mm -hmm. brings a bag for you. Okay. Yeah. What What do you have in that bag? <clears throat> uh, this would be packed RBCs. Anything else will be there. Um, right. Uh, this This I think I I'm I, I I'm understanding gradually what's happening. Uh, right. Okay. Fine. So, are you aware of any standards or guidelines given by? Some committee on this major hemorrhage protocol. Um, giving tranexamic acid is part of the major hemorrhage protocol, and this there is a uh, the the guidelines advise loading the patient with one gram and another gram over eight hours. What is the landmark trial which showed tranexamic acid is reduces the mortality in this setting? I don't remember his name. Okay. Sorry. Fine. So uh, which which is the standard committee in the UK which gives guidelines around this hematology issues, transfusion transfusion related guidelines? I don't remember. That's fine. So, uh, so in in all these major transfusion situations, okay, what are all the problems you can get as a result of major blood transfusion? Um. 
uh, the main or the the highest risk would be the clerical error in trans in in dispensing the blood uh, the blood bags and causing uh, incompatible blood transfusion or in general blood transfusion reactions and uh, complications. Okay, so the first bag comes in. Okay, mm -hmm. you have transfused the patient, and the patient's blood pressure has gone up to ninety by sixty. Okay. okay, and the heart rate has come down to 120. Okay, so okay. how are you going to reassess the patient's bloods and what all you will do after the initial transfusion? Right. Um, I will, I will, uh, I would like to know, like, take full sets of bloods. I want to know what his lactate is to see how state of a shock he's in, like, if he's high, it's high lactate. This is in anaerobic uh, metabolism. Um, I want to keep an eye on his HB as a baseline. I want to uh, keep monitoring his blood pressure and heart rate. If it stays, if it stays at the same level and not dropping again, this would be uh, this the the patient would be reasonably stable now with blood pressure of ninety over six. Anything else? So, so what is your what is your aim of reassessing his bloods after the initial transfusion? What is your aim? What is your goal? <laughs> Uh, how I want to know what uh, how adequate adequate the resuscitation is, mm -hmm. and I can get um, subtle information about what kind of and uh, what kind of injury am I dealing with? If, are the liver enzymes too high? This might this may indicate liver injury. Um, um, obviously, the lactate will will determine if there is um, the the degree of shock and how much how 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 much time have we spent before starting the resuscitation. Right. What is the major problem in all these bleedings in terms of coagulopathy and stuff? Right. Uh, the 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 triad of death is the problem with the trauma. So the hypothermia that I that the patient could have been exposed to, and this is part of the things that we correct with exposure. And uh, the coagulopathy from the massive blood transfusion, but from the sound of it, we haven't we haven't given him only one unit. I wouldn't expect this to derange his blood, but obviously, I would I would like to see his clotting. And uh, finally, the acidosis, if there is a level of acidosis. So, how do you uh, uh, contract hypothermia during these major transfusions? Uh, uh, a, I would warm the blood, so there is a warmer for the blood transfusion. Mm -hmm. uh, B, I would cover the patient with bear hugger after okay. ensuring that you have no okay. any hidden. Are you aware of any point of care test which would guide what blood or blood product needs to be transfused in this patient? Uh, yes, I'm aware of a... I'm not sure what its name is. It's a kit or something like that. It's uh, it basically is a bedside point of care test that tests what kind of blood products uh, that is deficient in the formation of a blood clot, and um, it basically tells us what we need to transfuse. Is it platelets that the prop that is the problem or so it is called TEG? Yeah, TEG. Yes, TEG. Yes. Teg. Teg. Okay, fine. Let me continue with the next person. Hamza, you want to continue? Yes. Yeah. So imagine the same patient. Okay. Imagine the patient is not intubated. Okay. Patient is not intubated, um, but patient is coming. Patient's blood pressure is 80 by 60 millimeters of mercury. Young guy trying to compensate. Okay. And you are trying to trans. You are thinking that patient is bleeding, and you are transfusing. Okay. And all of a sudden, over a period of like, patient is um, maintaining his hemodynamics with the transfusion okay but down the line six to eight hours after the transfusion patient develops uh, breathlessness okay what will you think of so patients already finished all the primary survey with that junk right with the chest x-ray and yeah fast. yeah yeah so and, exactly yeah so imagine this patient uh, uh you had did a fast scan patient had free yeah. fluid ct scan was done which is showing grade three liver injury Okay, but patient has become hemodynamically stable after say seven units of blood transfusion. Patient is in intensive care unit, alert and awake. Okay, but eight hours after the hospital admission, patient develops acute onset breathlessness. 
what are all the differential diagnoses? Uh, I would think that is a complication of, uh, I will mainly concern about the complication of massive transfusion, like uh, transfusion lung injury, mm -hmm. or uh, maybe transfusion uh, uh, overloads, uh, as that will be my main concern as a complication of massive transfusion of the blood. However, Anything I will also keep... Would suspect? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 I will also keep uh, uh, an idea about uh, uh, if there's any uh, allergic reaction to the uh, blood product. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I will also keep an eye on the patient state as a whole. So uh, we need to keep uh, keep uh, uh, keep uh, keep in our mind that this patient is not responding. And uh, he has decreased now. What else, what else it could be? A patient with trauma, eight hours later, also developing chest uh, things. What else it could be apart from the blood transfusion related problems? Uh, I mean, still from the, uh, if he uh, still has uh, an injury mainly from the trauma. I mean, uh, if patient has a flail chest, uh, if patient has. Uh, 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 pulmonary contusion, a uh, patient has uh, uh, multiple rib fracture that caused him shortness of breath and decrease or two sacks. So that's okay. need to be assessed. Imagine during this time, patient develops arrhythmias. Arrhythmia. What will you do? What do you suspect? So uh, this is if this patient uh, develop uh, uh, arrhythmia and he's unstable. So we need to uh, go directly to do the uh, cardioversion. However, mm -hmm. I will also uh, think of uh, a fat embolism. As so do you has, think uh, all arrhythmias need cardioversion? If it's unstable. Yeah. If it's if it unstable, patient is yes. unstable. Imagine patient is having irregular heart rate for some reason or ectopics, okay, in a young patient following trauma, okay, like this, okay? What do you think? What do you suspect first? Uh, I mean, uh, after from it could be uh, thinking of also cardiac tamponade. Uh, Anything uh, else? A cardiac injury. Cardiac um, injury, okay, fine, yeah? Yeah. Right, okay, so we were discussing about FAST. What is FAST? Focal assisted, uh, uh, it's, a, it's an abdominal ultrasound, focal assisted sonography. Uh, uh, it's sorry, will focus? Look for, oh, sorry. Uh, focused assisted focus? sonographic test. Fast assisted fast okay. assist sonographic test. Focused. Okay, fine. All right. Okay, we will discuss later. So what, what do we do in FAST? Uh, we are doing FAST to rule out any uh, uh, collection, uh, mainly bleeding. So this is the uh, quick used way bedside to roll out any collection. We will look so at for where, uh, where will you look for this collection? Where will you look for this collection? You more, you will look for the thigh, calf, chest, neck. Where do you look for? Uh, abdomen, of course. We are looking for four uh, sites. We are talking about Morrison pouch and the uh, perispinic area and epigastric area and pelvic area. So we need to. Uh, Why uh, yeah, What so do you see in the epigastric area? Uh, pericardium. I mean. Okay. Uh, that's fine. Okay, yeah. that's fine. What is what do you understand by the term E fast? Sorry again, please. E fast, not fast. E, e fast, e or fast. in other words, ex extended fast. Extended fast. I think uh, it will be more like uh, taking another area, like uh, a chest, mm -hmm. maybe, or yeah. Fine. I mean, look okay. for any uh, pneumothorax. So you were telling about uh, some lung injury post blood transfusion. What is it called? Uh, acute transfusion, uh, acute transfusion, ATL, the acute transfusion lung injury. Acute transfusion related <laughs> acute lung injury. Lung, yeah. Acute transfusion related lung injury. Yeah. That's fine. T R A L. That's, okay. That's fine. How will you differentiate yeah. trolley? So what what is meant by TACO? TACO. Uh, it's uh, 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 overload. Uh, this is the transfusion uh, overload, right. like cardiac right. overload. So a patient post massive blood transfusion is having acute onset breathlessness. Okay, how do you differentiate whether this patient is having trolley or taco? 
So uh, mainly the uh, the time uh, to interaction in uh, land engineering within six months. And mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, in uh, uh, it's transfusion lung injury, it's non cardiogenic, uh, non cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So, there the CVB will be normal, unlike the transfusion overload. Uh, and uh, yeah, so yeah, I think maybe CVB something fine. Okay, so what do you so you told a blunt chest injury patient could have had cardiac tamponade. What are the signs of cardiac tamponade? When will you suspect patient has a cardiac tamponade? So he has a muffled heart sound, uh, hypertension, and uh, uh, sound. He has, he, there's a triad, big, big triad, I think it's called. Big mm -hmm. triad, I think. Mm -hmm. Distinct what big is pain. Triad? Yeah. A muffled heart sound, distended neck vein, and hypertension. All right. Okay. We will stop here. Okay. We will stop here. Okay. This is one of a very common scenario of trauma. Okay. So in the critical care, okay, definitely you will in the critical care section, you will have one or two trauma cases. Okay. Which could be of any trauma, um, which we will discuss again. Okay. Again, even in this exam, they had two trauma situations. Okay. So any trauma, okay, what you need to know is what, what was the patient's uh, condition in which the patient was brought in. Okay, so always, always when you start, let me let me mute you, Hamza, just a minute. Yeah, sorry. So always, what you need to know is whenever a question is asked in the exams, okay, from the question, okay, you have to start answering your uh, giving your responses by giving a landing sentence. Okay, a landing sentence is something with which you start answering to a particular scenario. This landing sentence is very, very important for a candidate to create an impression with the examiner. Okay, so basically, you should utilize this landing sentence to tell what do you feel about the situation. Um, you need to tell your uh, your higher order thinking. Okay, when you say higher order thinking, it needs to tell that like what are all the possibilities in this patient coming with these problems and what are all your concerns and you should show your maturity for example if this patient if, if when uh, when uh, when the question is asked to you you should start telling that means i am concerned about the situation okay this is a very high impact injury and patient can have all the possible traumas starting from head injury neck injury chest uh, blunt injury abdomen and peripheral limb injuries okay my priority here is to um, save the patient's life going through the ATLS principles, A, B, C, D, E approach. Okay, that's all you need to say. Okay, and I will always A, B, C, D, E, as Mohammed told, first time probably a candidate has correctly told, always A stands for airway and cervical spine immobilization. Okay, A stands for that. Okay, B is breathing, C is circulation, D is disability, that is fine. Okay, and the most important key principle with ATLS where the examiners will take you is so you will tell that I will look for a, a cervical spine breathing circulation and they will give you these disease values and you will just go on what 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 okay once a b c d e is finished and if the patient is stable the next step before the secondary survey is adjuncts to the primary survey okay the adjuncts to the primary survey includes chest x-ray okay uh, x-ray cervical spine fast scan, all bloods, blood gas, OK? So these are the things you will ask for in the primary survey. Nowadays, we also include CT traumogram, OK? So you, if you tell the word CT traumogram, rather than telling CT brain, neck, chest, and abdomen, it it uh, it gives the um, the examiner a good feel, and it, it, it includes everything. It's called CT traumo traumogram, OK? And what happens is, during the scenario, they will tell that at some point patient deteriorates. Okay, some point patient deteriorates. What you'll do? Okay, so the catch point here is you need to go ahead and you have to start everything from the beginning. That is what they expect. So, but majority of the candidates will tell the oh patient is uh, bleeding now. I would like to transfuse. You need to tell that I will restart the ATLS principle starting from A B C D E. This is one of the very very common scenario which is always asked. Okay, and very common questions are um this uh, what is major hemorrhage okay which
Vicky told very rightly, uh, massive blood transfusion definition. Okay, Ma major hemorrhage protocol is something which everyone should know. And uh, apparently, different hospitals have slightly modified massive hemorrhage protocol. But there is a committee called as the British Committee for Standards in Hematology. Okay, British Committee for Standards in Hematology, which has given guidelines on what is major hemorrhage protocol. The key principle in major hemorrhage protocol is when when we transfuse a lot of RBCs, patient will go into coagulopathy and patient will bleed to death. Okay, so the principle of major hemorrhage protocol is to transfuse RBCs along with platelets, along with FFP, along with cryo, based on some ratio. Okay, so. After the initial resuscitation with crystalloids or O-negative blood, if you think that the patient is bleeding, you initiate the major hemorrhage protocol. The major hemorrhage protocol is controlled by the intensivist or the a &E consultant, the on-call hematology consultant, okay, the blood bank manager, and the uh, team uh, in the um, the what to say the um, the ward in charge or whoever it is. Okay, once you activate, okay, you will get the first major hemorrhage pack okay that is called the first bag the first bag will have four rbcs four ffps and one single donor platelet okay you transfuse all these things okay four rbcs four ffps and one single donor platelet okay you transfuse all these things and then reassess. okay so in the reassessment you need to send all the bloods gases prothrombin time if possible try to do a tag lactate and everything if the patient continues to bleed you bring you ask for the next bag the next bag will have apart from whatever you had in the first bag you will have two more cryos okay you'll have two cryos which is added if patient further bleeds, obviously go for the third bag by the time you will be making the theater ready and you take the patient to theater okay so this is called the major hemorrhage protocol and you need to know everything around um uh, this tranexamic acid, whichever you told, is based on the CRASH-2 trial, okay? <coughs> so you need to know what is CRASH-2 trial, what is CRASH-3 trial. Ca CRASH-2 trial is a trial which showed tranexamic acid in a trauma patient prevents mortality, okay? Uh, CRASH-3 trial is tranexamic acid in a trauma patient uh, uh, improves the outcome in a patient with traumatic brain injury, actually. That is called CRASH-3, okay? So they will uh, ask what is the difference between crash one and crash two. And the other, uh, the point of care test which I told is TEG, okay, thromboelastogram. Thromboelastogram or TEG is the answer for that. And you are expected to know what is TEG and what are all the various components which is seen in the TEG and what will you give if a particular component is abnormal within this TEG. I'm not going in detail. And uh, transfusion related complications, you all need to know. Okay, so trolley, taco, etc. Right. Any questions so far? Anything later? Yes, Bargish, Muhammad. Uh, yeah. So who, who is responsible? If you ask them, who is responsible to uh, initiate this uh, major hemorrhage protocol or Usually, the hematology consultant in charge will be will be governing the things okay he will be deciding but the initiating thing is by the a &E consultant yeah yeah all right let us move on okay let us move on okay so who wants to go Bagesh, you want to go Mohammed Bagesh. yeah but don't grill me so much no Please. i won't tell you <laughs> <laughs> okay fine so Bagesh, so again you are a consultant on call and you get a patient okay via a &E, who is a 44 years old female who has underwent previous gastric bypass for morbid obesity two years back okay who is presenting with fever and jaundice okay how do you proceed um fever and jaundice okay gastric bypass four years ago uh, sorry remind me uh, uh, about the age please again 44 40 years old 44 years okay. Yeah, so I will go assist the patient uh, as per the CRISP protocol. I will assist uh, airway, pre, uh, ABC, A to E uh, kind of assessment. Um, that's 
uh, if she is hemodynamically stable, um, I will proceed to the second part of the CRISP, which is chart review. I will have a look at her um, uh, observations, her uh, recent bloods. Um, if I have access to the previous operation, I will have a look at it. If she had any previous kind of uh, scans or anything, I will go through everything. Following that, I will start taking um, thorough history from the patient, including um, uh, uh, when did the fever started, when did the, the joints start, uh, how about mm -hmm. her ur urine color, stool color, um, um, and I will ask if that was associated with any kind of pain and has this happened before or not. Um, after all this, um, I will uh, request some set of bloods, including FPCs. Okay. Using so patient says that patient people. was apparently fine. Okay, patient was doing fine. All of a sudden, patient developed some epigastric pain three days back. Okay, and um, um, someone told that she her eyes has become yellow and she has developed fever since morning. Okay. Um, so again, I will have a look at her observations, um, as I mentioned before, um, and I will uh, request full set of bloods, as I mentioned, including FPCs, US and E's, LFTs, and uh, CRP. Um, so what get... is your main worry here? What is your main worry here? What are the differential diagnoses? So uh, the differential diagnosis, usually patient with a history of, of uh, bariatric surgery, um, uh, they develop gallstones. Uh, and in this situation, the lady might have had gallstones which had escaped through the, the duct, causing um, CBD stone, causing the jaundice. Why do you think that patient has fever? Yeah, that was, that's complicated by infection causing cholangitis. So my first differential now is ascending cholangitis because of um, uh, a stone which escaped uh, through the, the... If you suspect ascending cholangitis in this patient, what is your priority? Okay, while you are waiting for blitz. Um, my priority, so obviously, is to to uh, keep her. So, so this patient is is, and might go into sepsis. So, I need to initiate the sepsis six protocol, um, uh, which includes uh, uh, fluids, which includes uh, taking blood tests to look at the uh, lactate. Uh, to give uh, broad spectrum antibiotics um, um, uh, and to give oxygen and um, what else? Um, yeah. We, so you we give you give three, you take three. Yes. Yes. You have given three. You have given oxygen. You gave uh, antibiotics. Yeah. Uh, and you gave fluids. IV fluids. Okay. What do you take out? One you told. Lactate. Okay. Um, and I take um, blood culture and urine notebook. Blood culture, yeah, blood culture, yeah. This is the one. I remember it was the old buffalo. But anyway. Okay, fine. <laughs> blood culture and urine output. Fine. So you're doing all these things, okay? So you get your blood test. You've started all these things. Um, your blood test report comes, okay? As you suspected, a patient has an obstructive picture, okay? Yeah. Total counts is 18,000. CRP is 340. How will you proceed further? Um, so, um, so following following that, I will make sure that the patient is resuscitated, fully resuscitated with uh, uh, the appropriate IV fluids. I will give the patient vitamin K uh, at the moment because of the uh, because of the obstruction. As I mentioned, I will give broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, following that, I arrange some sort of a scan. Um, ideally, what, what some sort of scan will you will you ask for ultrasound pelvis? Uh, no, so so I, ideally speaking, we should start with an ultrasound uh, abdomen to look for gold stones. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but in this situation, because the patient is septic, I might proceed to this to CT uh, abdomen pelvis with contrast to rule out any kind of gold bladder perforation or any. Right. So what what all what so you have done a CT scan, okay? Yeah. And you are going and sitting in front of your packs. What all you would see in a CT scan in this particular patient? What is your what is what all things you will look in specifically? Uh, so I will look 
uh, I will look at the gallbladder itself to look uh, for thick walled gallbladder because this might be a, a acute cholecystitis. I will try to have a look if there is if there are any stones. Sometimes it's not common, but sometimes we can actually see the stones. I will mm -hmm. have a look at the uh, common bile duct di uh, uh, diameter and try to see if the common bile duct is dilated. Um, and I will try to look if there is any fluid collection around the gallbladder. Finally, I'll have a look at the pancreas to make sure that it's not inflamed and this uh, uh, CVD stone is not complicated by pancreatitis as well. Fine. So you do a CT scan and as you thought, there is a dilated CBD, okay? But they couldn't see a stone in the CT scan, okay? Ultrasound, sorry, the gallbladder looks normal. Okay, and there is intrahepatic biliary radical dilatation. Yeah. Um, so again, it depend. Uh, it depend upon the patient. If the patient is hemodynamically stable enough to wait for an MRCP, I will proceed to, to an MRCP to look for the stones because up till now we don't have any proof that the patient has got stones or not. Uh, so I'll proceed with an MRCP to look for the stones and look for any uh, film defect in the CBD. And if there are stones in the, in the CBD, uh, then we'll proceed to an ERCP to clear the stones out. Fine. Uh, if, yeah. what, is, what is the triad of cholangitis? Uh, uh, it's abdominal pain, jaundice, and fever. Charcot's okay. triad. What is the pentad associated with cholangitis? So um, altered mental status and hypotension. Fine. So, fine. So this patient, you have you have done an MRCP, and MRCP shows stone in the distal CBD mm -hmm. with dilated bile duct, and you think that the patient is in cholangitis. Mm -hmm. What will you do next? So the next step will be tricky because the patient has history of gastric bypass, so an ERCP might not be the best option to deal with this situation because you will not be able to go into the CBD and cannulate from. Uh, like retrograde. Um, so there is an option of um, laparoscopic transistic uh, CVD exploration uh, to try to clear the stones from uh, transistically. Alternatively, there is a way, but that needs like a very good uh, gastroenterologist to do an ERCP, like to put an axis stent between the, the remnant of the, of the, of the stomach um, and uh, like to reconnect what they have uh, disconnected and then do an ERCP. What, what, is, what is that procedure called? Um, uh, this um, uh, double ballooned, uh, no, um, this is the edge procedure. Yeah. It's the edge procedure, very good. Okay, what else is an option? So you told one is a laparoscopic CBD exploration. Second yeah. is you told an endoscopic edge procedure. What else? What else could be done? What other options? So, um, is uh, so the third option will be PTC if if there is um, dilated, but it, this needs dilated intrahepatic biliary radical in order to to go uh, with the PTC through the liver and then uh, clear the duct from there. What else is another option? What else could be done? Imagine. Um, you don't have an uh, option for edge. You don't have a surgeon who has, who has experience to do a CBD exploration. And you don't have an intervention radiologist who can do a PTC. Um, what is the yeah, problem? I, I, I will discuss transferring the patient to uh, the HPB unit. Uh, no, what, else, what else could be done? Anything else could be done? Um, sorry, I don't know. Okay, so let me just share. Uh, sorry, this this one. Let tell me what do you see here? What do you see here? Uh, so this is okay. Um. So that's a, a, a coronal section of an MRI or an MRCP showing the gallbladder uh, the, and the dilated, dilated CBD with a filling defect at the distal end. 
um, and it shows some dilated uh, intrahepatic biliary radicals. So that's right. a CBT store. So what is what is this image? What is this picture as a whole? Is it a CT or what is it? No, that's an MRCP, isn't it? No. Yeah, it is MRCP. Yeah. So what is an MRCP? So the MRCP is um, it's some sort of an MRI scan, magnetic resonant imaging, um, dedicated to the biliary uh, tree um, mm -hmm. in order to to show us uh, like detailed picture of the biliary tree. Okay, so you could see that there are some contrast here. How do they give this contrast in this MRCP? Uh, gadolinium. So MRCP can can be done with gadolinium um, as a contrast. Okay. But if you give gadolinium, how did it drain into the bile alone and not in other part of the body? Yeah, I don't know. Okay, MRCP, whether it is a T1 image or a T2 image? Um, that's T2. What is T2? Um, so in T2, the water is white. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's how I know it. Fine. In, in right. T1, it's, the fat is white. All right. Okay. We'll stop here. Okay. We will stop here. Let me stop sharing. Yeah, good. So how did you do? So you did well, actually. You did well. The most important thing in this scenario is it is a difficult situation in a patient with a, ba a bariatric procedure presenting with an obstructive jaundice. The key thing here is a candidate should appreciate the fact that a uh, straightforward ERCP is not possible in this patient. And what other options and how do you wait which procedure you can do where? That is the whole purpose of this uh, thing. Okay, uh, you did you did most of it. Okay, the, the fourth option is you can do a lap assisted ERCP. Yeah, so you can do a diagnostic lap. You you identify the remnant stomach. You make a purse string. You make a gastrotomy, and through a port, the gastroenterologist can put in a scope into the stomach. They can do an ERCP, and then you can do that is the fourth option which is available. And MRCP, we don't give any contrast in an MRCP. Okay, so MRCP. Although it stands for magnetic resonant cholangiopancreaticogram, it is a non-contrast MRI where the fluid in the body is taken, it's shown as a con weighted T2 image. Okay, that is MRCP. Okay. Uh, other than that, uh, yeah. So again, here, you know, the most important things um, which we just like to tell in the exams is. You should be very careful in using the loose terms. Like I will do some blood tests. Okay, I will start some fluids. Okay, uh, I will do some scan. Okay, these are all the words which which are the killer words in the exam. Okay, the moment you tell this, the examiner will get so irritated. They'll tell what you want to do. Okay, so you should be very very careful when you tell. So everything which you say should add something to the patient's management. That's all you. That's what. That is how you should aim for. We, you don't have time, say, for example, this scenario, whichever we, we discussed, okay, this is exactly the same scenario which we had for the mock waiver recently. And the entire scenario which we discussed for 17 minutes so far with you should have been finished in five minutes. Okay, so this is the, so so you, you need to answer very, very quickly. This is a, so especially in a short case, okay, a patient presenting with this, how do you say? So I am concerned about the situation. Uh, because it's a bariatric patient, and the most differential, most common differential diagnosis is uh, obstructive jaundice secondary to stones. However, other problems like uh, pancreatic cancer, biliary stricture, uh, Mirzi syndrome, everything else is possible. I would like to take a focused history. Any short case, you use this words. I will use a focused history from get a focused history from the patient. Send all the blood tests. Start statistic protocol. That's all. By this time, one minute is over. The next, the examiner will tell. Okay, I will do this, this, this investigations to look for these, 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 these things. The examiner will tell. Okay, this is this. Okay, these are the options. Yeah. Okay. So, but you did well actually. You did very well. Okay. Good. Right. Let me move on. Uh, Hamza. Yes, Hamza. Tell me, Hamza. 
I just uh, want to make sure I'm, uh, there's something I read before the, about spy glass, spy glass uh, endoscopy. Is it uh, a possible technique here? So spy glass is, so, yeah, so spy glass is basically, so in ERCP, what we do is we go into the ampulla, we cannulate the ampulla, and beyond that, everything is seen in a fluoroscopy. The injectors die into the bile duct, they will take an x-ray to look for the filling defect. They send the basket, they retrieve. Okay, everything is done under fluoroscopic guidance. Okay. In spyglass, what we do is once we reach the ampulla, we put another small scope through the endoscope and we put a we pass a scope through the bile duct up to wherever we want. Okay. These are usually done for complex biliary strictures to take biopsies, especially in cases with cholangiocarcinomas. Okay and sometimes difficult stones okay stones which are not retrieved through ERCP we can use spyglass to go you can use spyglass guided uh, you can use you can break the stones and you can retrieve it under direct vision this is called spyglass Thank yeah you. the other things as a surgeon you all need to know is when you say uh, CBD exploration you need to know uh, what are the types of CBD exploration? What kind of scopes you use? Uh, how you? What are the um, maneuvers to retrieve the stones and things like that? Okay, those things we will discuss later. That's not a problem. Okay, right. Let me move on. Mohammed Sarwar, are you here? Yes. Right. Let me pin you so you come onto the screen. Right. Okay. Let me. What specialty you are in, Mohammed? Colorectal. Go like the point, right? Okay, uh, Mohammed. Again, you are a consultant on call, and you are in the hospital. Okay, uh, in the evening, when a 34-year-old male is brought into a &E following multiple stab injuries in a local gang fight. Okay, the patient is in the a &E now. Okay, patient's GCS is 14 by 15. Okay, and a trauma call was put out, and you are there. Okay. How will you proceed in the situation? I will assess and resuscitate the patient according to the ATLS uh, protocol mm -hmm. in line with the ABCD approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, priority is given to the life-threatening emergen uh, life uh, emergencies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I will uh, take the focused history of the patient symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, and. Uh, uh, I will complete the primary survey with the adjunct, including mm -hmm. the chest X-ray, pelvic X-ray, fast scan, mm -hmm. and uh, then I will uh, conclude uh, the. So I will do the secondary survey Fine. with the uh, right. image. So, so secondary survey you do it later. So during your examination, you see that patient has a contusion in the left-sided chest wall. Okay, there are some crepitus in the left-sided chest wall. Okay. Um, and you could see there are three stab wounds in the abdomen with one of the stab wounds having omentum which is protruded out. Okay, so I will uh, give priority to the A and B. Mm -hmm. I will make sure there's no any open pneumothorax. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that I on clinical examination, I can um, assess the patient. If there is any any concern, I will put the chest uh, train immediately. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, and I will uh, uh, with regard to the abdomen, I will uh, locally examine the abdomen for uh, looking for any signs of peritonism, mm -hmm. and I will. Uh, whatever the organ is coming out i will uh, put a, a warm swab on it to cover it and uh, while Fine. So you sure examine the abdomen system. patient is not peritonitic okay uh, patient is not peritonitic airway is fine patient is breathing normally respiratory rate of 14 saturation is uh, 99 um, with um, 4 liters of oxygen okay what next so I will, and the patient resuscitation is going on. I will make sure that, that he have a two IV lines, baseline. All this are done. Everything is done. Off. Patient is hemodynamically stable, A, B, C, D, E done. I will like to get a CT thorax abdomen pelvis mm -hmm. uh, as the patient is stable and uh, then uh, proceed accordingly. Okay. So this is the, you can see here. Uh, yes, so I yes I can see 
uh, is uh, the axial CT scan of uh, uh, the abdomen, I can see some uh, uh, perihepatic fluid mm -hmm. uh, with uh, uh, it seems like there's a splenic rupture as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, some fluid in the um, yeah, perihepatic fluid and uh, and the splenic. Uh, what 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 and CT it is? It's the axial CT scan of the abdomen. Yeah, whether it is plain CT, contrast CT. It's either with the contrast, as I can see, the contrast in the iota. What face? Uh, I would say it's a uh, arterial face. Can it be a venous face? Uh, in venous face, it would. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll just. Mm. That's fine. Okay, so what? So you told that patient has some free fluid, some splenic injury. Okay, fine. So while during doing the CT scan, okay, patient collapses. Okay, patient blood pressure drops. Patient is becoming suddenly tachypneic, and patient is sweating. What will you do? So patient have become unstable. I will. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will make sure that I will uh, let the theater uh, staff know and uh, make sure the uh, enough blood is available. Uh, and uh, I will call my anesthetist colleague uh, and uh, I will take the patient to the, um, the theater for uh, uh, damage control. The so by, from the time you had seen this, okay, and to the time where you can initiate a laparotomy. How fast you can do? Can you do it in five minutes from the CT room to the theater and doing a laparotomy? It will take some 10, yeah. 15, uh, half so, an hour. It will so, take some time. so are you going to allow this patient like that for half an hour? No, I, I will I will keep resuscitating the patient. I will make mm -hmm. sure that he's getting the blood product mm -hmm. as I'm uh, suspecting there is a, a massive bleed intra-abdominal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, while resuscitating the patient, I will, and while organizing the mobilizing the theater staff and mm -hmm. the anesthetist and the mm -hmm. whole team, mm -hmm. uh, I will take the patient to to the theater straight from the CT scan. Okay, so you are asking, so patient is reinitiated on resuscitation. Your registrar is staying with the patient, and you are going up to the theater. What all things you will tell the theater staff before coming there? Or speak to the anesthetist. What all information you would like to communicate to the anesthetist? So it will be uh, it uh, depend. Uh, it will be. I want to make sure that enough packs are available mm -hmm. for the packing, mm -hmm. and uh, the vascular set is available. Major laparotomy set is available. Mm -hmm. Just in case if there is any uh, intrathoracic thoracic injury, I want mm -hmm. uh, the cardiothoracic on board as well, or mm -hmm. vascular surgeon on board as well, mm -hmm. my colleague. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, make sure the enough blood is available, tag is available. Uh, fine, and that's okay. That's fine. Cells so available. Any, any other scoring you want to do before taking the patient to theater? Scoring. Mm, is uh, AST scoring great? No. No. What what scoring we do very commonly for all the emergency laparotomies in the UK? Okay, NILA score? Yes. So what is NILA okay. scoring? So it's uh, basically National Emergency Laparotomy Audit. Yeah. It uh, score. Mm -hmm. And it, it will tell us, uh, we put it on the MD cal score calculator, and then we can calculate uh, the morbidity and mortality uh, based on the patient uh, age, uh, morbidities. Ah, and, okay. uh, so you all done this, OK? You have taken the patient to theater, OK? So how will you do a trauma laparotomy? I will prepare the patient from the neck to mid thighs, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, I I will start, I will give start prep and drape and generous mm -hmm. uh, midline uh, incision, and mm -hmm. I will pack the fourth quadrant with mm -hmm. the counting in counting out uh, count the swabs, mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, I will uh, look for uh, the bleeding from the side, start from the side where that is, uh, I suspect, the uh, least uh, point of bleeding from that right. place. So and you, you, open, you do a laparotomy, OK? You do a When you say four quadrant packing, so what is, how do you pack, how do you do this four quadrant packing? 
so it will be the liver uh, right upper quadrant packing in mm -hmm. which uh, the liver around like sandwich technique mm -hmm. and then um, on the uh, left side as well uh, mm -hmm. left upper quadrant mm -hmm. and then uh, move the transverse colon and uh, put the swabs on the uh, one side of the mesentery and uh, then on the other side of the mesentery and then the pelvic packing as well okay you have done this you have done the packing what next so i will start moving the packs from the area that i suspect least bleeding before that and you the, want to do anything i would make sure the i will make sure i will talk with my anesthetist colleague and make sure that he, he catch up with the um, with the hemodynamically and yeah. uh, resuscitate him and Fine. then uh, so when you open this abdomen you see that there is a moderate to massive hemoperitoneum and also you see some entry content okay and because the patient is bleeding you had put all the swaps now okay so what so you have spoken to the anesthetist anesthetists have uh, started transfusion and they're telling you to proceed so how are you going to proceed so um, so there is some cont uh, uh, bowel like uh, perforation yes. as well yeah. yeah so i will i will put a swab on it and i will put um, um, uh, Babcock or even mm -hmm. suture uh, at the mm -hmm. moment, and mm -hmm. then I will proceed first. Go with the uh, with the bleeding, mm -hmm. control the bleeding first, and mm -hmm. then I will come back uh, uh, to deal with the bowel. Okay, so you see that the splenic area, spleen is profusely bleeding. What are all the maneuvers you can do to stop the bleeding uh, straight away from the spleen? So I can uh, directly put the pressure. Mm -hmm. I where can, uh, where will you put the pressure? Uh, I can uh, at the hilum. Okay. I can hold you, it with my put... hands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, in between the fingers. Okay. And uh, see whether uh, whether there is uh, any bleeding, uh, what, so that I can uh, see the exactly point of bleeding and assess the uh, injury Fine. severity, and then. Uh, I, Fine. I, I, so I you, you put a finger there and you, you see that the bleeding has stopped. Okay. And you see that the spleen is shattered. You, you have completed a splenectomy. Okay. Now you had put a pack there. And what are you going to do with this bowel now? So if, if the bowel, uh, I will, if the bowel is uh, less than 50% uh, injury, then I will just primarily repair it. And uh, I will thorough, thoroughly wash the abdomen with the six Fine. liters of. So you are trying, you are doing this. Okay. You are, you are, you became very happy that you have stopped the bleeding. You are trying to wash this. Suddenly, anesthetist is shouting that patient is becoming hypotensive again. So, uh, they, uh, so I, 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 I will doubt there's a, uh, there's uh, bleeding somewhere else. Mm -hmm. It could be retroperitoneal. It could be mm -hmm. intrathoracic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I would like to see if the images are available or the CT scan we did earlier. Will you have uh, time to go and see the CT scan? You would have obviously seen, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. OK. Yeah. So one, so one uh, is the retroperitoneal region which could bleed. What else could bleed? Intrathoracic. It could okay. be cardiac tamponade. It could be intrathoracic. Okay. Uh, hemo, hemothorax. Okay. And uh, right. so, as you pelvics. suspected, you saw the retroperitoneum, and you see that the retroperitoneum there is a retroperitoneal bleed which is slowly expanding. What will you do? Okay, I, I would like to get the vascular help that mm -hmm. uh, it might will be major um, aortic or uh, vena cava injury. So mm -hmm. I would like to get the vascular colleague on board uh, to help me. How will you classify and, uh, retroperitoneal injuries? Do you know any zones so, associated with retroperitoneal yeah. injuries? So there are three zones. The central zone is a grade one. A lateral zones, the kidney zones are uh, um, zone two, and uh, below the bifurcation in the pelvis is uh, zone right. three. So you you see that the ex the vas the hematoma the retroperitoneal hematoma is expanding, and you don't have vascular surgery in your hospital. What do you do? In that case, uh, I have to. It, if I suspecting, um, I have to uh, mobilize. If it's central hematoma, I have to explore it, and um, it, it will be uh, either uh, uh, right sided. Uh, uh, so patient is patient is realization. Yeah, patient is bleeding. Yeah, patient is bleeding. Patient is becoming hypotensive. 
do you think you will have time to do all these things what else you could do to stop the bleeding i i can put uh, if the patient is uh, we are losing the patient then we can uh, do the supraciliac uh, aortic clamp okay. uh, while uh, mo mo mobilizing the bowel uh, fine so how do you do a supraciliac clamp what accesses you have so it will be uh, i will go through the uh, lesser omentum gastric mm -hmm. uh, hepatic ligament and mm -hmm. uh, uh, feel the aorta and uh, near the uh, aortic uh, entrance in uh, below the just below the diaphragm uh, and uh, I, I will put a clamp there fine so imagine this patient you have done that okay some bleeding has stopped and you found a small rent in an aorta which you have sutured okay so the going on to the bowel injury there are two uh, bowel injuries okay and uh, one injury is um, uh, one centimeter perforation, and the other injury is almost a near total circumference, which is opened up. So, so it, now the decision is based on how is the patient clinically, mm -hmm. whitely, whether he, I will check with my anesthetist colleague how he is whitely, how much inotropic, uh, inotropic sport he is on. And if he is stable and I have the time, I can go for the resection uh, anastomosis primarily. Otherwise, I will do the damage control laparotomy, just um, uh, use stapler and uh, just uh, come back. Uh, uh, once patient in 24 to 48 hours uh, to relook fine. laparotomy and so, uh, fine so you you are trying to close the abdomen uh, in that situation and you couldn't close the abdomen because of a lot of transfusion and edema how are you going to manage this open abdomen so um i usually i i'm using a thera dressing Mm -hmm. That basically that, that is available. The, that is a vacuum assisted dressing. Uh, I will uh, apply that, uh, and uh, then uh, I will come back in 24 hours, 24 to 48 right. hours once patient is uh, stabilized. Right. We will stop here. Yeah. Okay. Right. Good. So you did very well. Okay. It means uh, I tried to push you here and there, but you <laughs> managed it. It, it, it. it indirectly shows that you have a good experience in surgery that's what so this is what the the examiners like okay so rather than telling what you have read and trying to impress the examiners with uh, uh, whatever is the recent advances and things you need to you need to have a presence of mind in that clinical scenario and you need to be patient this is exactly the pace we would uh, like a candidate to answer you are not becoming anxious you are not going fast you are not going slow at the same time you are using your mind to see um, uh, what can happen what are the possibilities and things like that you did well okay to all others okay again a trauma laparotomy a very very common situation yeah the step one is a full midline laparotomy you need to know what is four quadrant packing and then speak to the anesthetist build up the transfusion make the hemodynamics and then you you go from the area which is clean to the possible bleeding area. The bleeding area, you need to approach the last, OK? If it is a spleen which is bleeding, you need to just put a vascular clamp, or you can put a finger in the splenic hilum, try to stop the bleeding and see what you can do. If it is a liver, again, you need to know about what the various maneuvers, the Pringle maneuver, the camping, and stuff like that, which we will discuss later. And um, depending, and you need to know um, uh, how how will you manage a pancreatic injury? How will you manage a duodenal injury? How will you manage a gastric injury? How will you manage a diaphragmatic injury? Um, uh, when will you suspect a thoracic injury? How will you access thorax during a, a laparotomy, whether you want to do a thoracotomy or not? What if the patient arrests when you're doing a laparotomy? How do you do uh, um, a, a direct cardiac massage um, and complete full thing about the retroperitoneal injuries. Um, how will you do a, a, a vascular means uh, the aortic cross clamp um, and those things, everything in trauma you need to know, OK? But this is how the examiner will take you, OK? The important thing which you need to know is um, in this exams, the, the examiners are given a particular theme and a few questions related to it, OK? The examiners can take you in various directions, actually, 
okay various directions which again as guided but so you can you can be asked anything a particular candidate would get a particular area questions the same scenario the next candidate will have a different scenarios uh, different questions related to the same scenario okay but um, but overall uh, this is how you need to answer any questions in this and the most important thing is only one thing which you didn't do well which i i told before but you didn't do is when a patient um suck means becomes unwell during the process of resuscitation you need to tell i will restart a b c d e okay. that's the most important thing yeah so okay. uh, so you. again uh, any emergency laparotomy have the habit of telling i will do a nila scoring um, i'll speak to the anesthetist i'll speak to the um, i'll do a adequate team brief asking for this one i will do a who checklist and then i'll take the patient to theater and things like that okay good okay thank you very much thank you any questions guys anyone else yes mohammed um sorry it's just um, so my, my knowledge about the nella website is that trauma is ex excluded from the website so we don't input uh, yeah you don't need to input cases so uh, based on that, the, the NELA score was based on the NELA kind of audit. So will it still work with, with trauma cases? That's my question. Like, should we say PPOSUM rather than NELA because this is a trauma case? It's a good question, actually. Uh, I, I am not 100% sure on that, okay? I, I need to discuss on that. But uh, as you rightly mentioned, um, uh, uh, I am not sure. I will just check and verify it. Okay, on this. Yeah, good. Right. Fine. So let us uh, move on. Okay. So so let me see who else. So Muhammad Hassan said, "Sir, where is Sharanya? Are you here?" I am here. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, Sharanya, your voice is not clear. Actually, we have the same problem also. Can you hear me now? We can, but still it is like it's like a voice which is very muffled. But let, let us let us continue. That's fine. Right. So Sharnia, so you are a consultant on call, okay, and uh, you are getting a call from the ward, okay, and um for a patient, okay, who was just admitted with abdominal pain. Okay, patient was admitted in the ward for further evaluation. Patient is hemodynamically stable. Okay, patient suddenly becomes breathless. Okay, uh, and having a significant breathing difficulty, hypotension, and bradycardia. Okay, and uh, uh, an arrest call was put up, and they had informed you as well. So, what do you think has happened in this patient? What are all the various differential diagnoses? Between hypotension and bradycardia. Patient is hypotensive, bradycardic, breathing difficulty. A patient who is straight away admitted in the ward for evaluation of abdominal pain suddenly becomes unwell. And is it a male, female patient? Is it a male or a female patient? It's a male patient. It's a male okay. patient. Okay. Um, I mean, I think of any hemorrhage, intra abdominal hemorrhage, mm -hmm. and sepsis. Mm -hmm. Uh, then I will also is it just a abdominal pain, okay. And um, then I'll possibly think of any uh, neurogenic shock. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, patient never had fever. Okay, patient never had fever. And when you go there, um, they have just done a blood gas. Okay, on admission, which is showing a hemoglobin of 130. Abdomen is soft. Bilateral air entry is fine. Okay. Uh, then I suspect it was for the pulmonary embolism. Mm -hmm. uh, because he's been having some abdominal pain and probably he was uh, lying for a long time before he came in the okay. hospital. Okay, that is one. What else could be? Um, Fine. So you suspect all these things. You suspect all these things. How will you approach the situation now? Patient is hypotensive, bradycardic, and has a... Uh, um, uh, Low saturation, yes. Okay. So I'll just wait. Um, he, he's, I presume he's, he's at arrest call was put in his being resuscitated and he's, has been successfully resuscitated? 
So what, what all things they will do in the uh, resuscitation? So I'll go to the patient and first I'll start with my, uh, according to the I'll start with my ABCD approach and I'll check the average and track and breathing. In that breathing, I presume you've got bilateral R and T equal, but I will still check for check, chest expansion and check for saturation. And um, then I'll do any breathing abnormality. I mean. Fine. So you go there, patient is given 15 liters of oxygen in a non-rebreathable mask, okay? And patient is breathing, but patient is responding, okay? The IV fluids is started, okay? On examining, you see that patient has rashes on the anterior and the posterior abdominal wall, full rashes. Okay. I'll ask the nurses in charge whether this got any recent drug administration mm -hmm. and maybe and there's anything else we, in the hospital we have given and since we have arrival. And also, if got any uh, ashes, including on all of his body or any areas, which is excluded, and is Fine. swelling. Of so, the so you asked the staff, and they said that the patient just came, and we gave uh, uh, antibiotics. They just gave an IV co-moxiclo for the patient as prescribed. If you think with ashes and breathing difficulties, I would suspect an anaphylactic shock in mm -hmm. the patient, mm -hmm. and I give him an inter I am adrenaline. Okay, fine. So, how do you how do you categorize? What are the types of uh, adverse drug reactions? What is type A reaction? What is type B reaction? Any idea? Okay. Are you aware of the types of hypersensitivity reaction? What is type one hypersensitivity? What is type two, type three, type four? The type one hypersensitivity is in um, type one is IgE mediated. Mm -hmm. So is immune complex mediated. Mm -hmm. Fine, that's okay. So what? where will you place, what is anaphylaxis? Is it type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4? What is anaphylaxis? It's type 1. Okay, so, so in this patient, you think that patient had probably had uh, anaphylaxis, okay? And uh, as you told, you gave IV, IM adrenaline, okay? patient immediately recovered okay? okay so but you don't know whether this patient is because has developed this breathlessness because of his pulmonary edema or whatever it is so how do you know what are all the biochemical evidence which can tell that this patient had an anaphylactic reaction recently what blood test you can do sorry any any other specific test you do to tell that this could be anaphylaxis. Okay, fine. So you give IM adrenaline for this patient, okay, and uh, patient not recovered. You wait for five minutes, okay, patient has not recovered. What will you do? Patient is again with them becoming uh, bradycardic and hypotensive. What next? Um, I can repeat another dose of IM adrenaline. Good. So you repeat another dose of IM adrenaline, okay, and you try to resuscitate the patient. You wait for another five minutes. Patient is not recovering. In the meantime, I would like to check you with airway mm -hmm. and also assist his breathing. I'll also mm -hmm. uh, invite you an anesthetic team for help in airway and breathing management. Mm -hmm. And um, okay, and then I will. And then I'll start giving him IV fluids to help with his blood pressure. And I probably will also add him need a vasopressor support to maintain his blood pressure. Okay, fine. So what, what will you give? So you gave two doses of IM uh, adrenaline if the patient, and you very strongly believe that this is anaphylactic reaction. So what next after two doses of IM adrenaline in the management of anaphylaxis? And I, I, this is a suspicious of mine. We, do, we don't have to do alternate causes of this. We look for alternate causes. Remote no, you, you believe that it is anaphylaxis. In the management of anaphylaxis, after two doses of IM adrenaline, what you can get? That's fine. OK, so what is what is HIT, H-I-T? Okay, so what are the types of heparin induced thrombocytopenia? Yeah, what is type one? Uh, type one is uh, due to the presence of heparin, which is uh, giving, uh, giving heparin to the patient. 
type two is uh, autoimmune mediated, and mm -hmm. uh, which is due to uh, autoimmune autoimmune reaction to the heparin. Okay, so how will you manage type one uh, from uh, hit, and how will you manage type two? So type one is less serious. We have to stop the heparin, and uh, the platelets will automatically come up after two to four days. But mm -hmm. as type two, we have to discuss with hematologists at the most severe, severe and positive hypothermia state. So it needs to be reversed with uh, for heparin. What what you need to reverse? Sorry. So we need to stop the heparin and discuss with hematologists for type two hit. Discuss with hematologists for what? For the type two hit. hit. Sorry. So so patient. So what is the what is the main problem with uh, uh, type two? So patient will have thrombocytopenia. Okay, will they be bleeding or they will be clotting? They'll be clotting. They'll be clotting. So what what are you going to reverse then? Yeah. We need, we need to treat it. You need to treat the clot. So how are you going to treat the clot? So you need to stop the heparin and you need to give oral anticoagulants. Yeah. Right. Okay. We will stop here. Okay. So again, anaphylactic reactions. Okay. Hypersensitivity reactions. Drug reactions. Okay. They can bring this in any level. Okay. They may tell that you are operating in the theater and suddenly patient becomes. So you say. Imagine. Very commonly, it comes in breast surgery. To be honest. Okay. So in the breast surgery, they you you are doing some central lymph node biopsy or something you're doing, and suddenly patient becomes hypotensive, bradycardic, and the anesthetist is telling look for bleeding, and you are doing a breast surgery, there is no bleeding, and then she you are telling you are discussing so so again that is a situation at least here the patient is not intubated, so you are trying that these are the features, but in a patient on table, how will you know patient has developed anaphylaxis is uh, looking at the it is basically diagnosis of exclusion. Okay, and related to any new drug or something which is given, which has a high potential of developing allergic reaction. For example, when you do a central lymph node biopsy, they can develop anaphylaxis to the dye which is used. Yeah, so that is um, one uh, uh, possibility. And another thing they can bring is they can bring the same scenario. Okay, in a patient with um, when you are operating, and they can take you into malignant hyperthermia. Okay, or they can take you into a thyroid patient developing into thyroid crisis, or they can take you into adrenal crisis and things like that. Okay, good. Any questions here? Yeah. No questions. Okay, fine. Let me move on. So, everyone in this uh, uh, candidates who consented. To present have done. So anyone else you want to volunteer who has not done so far? Just just come forward. It's fine. Rashid, you want to do? Unmute yourself, please. Yeah, I can go on. Yeah. I will ask you a very easy scenario for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> fine. Right. So Rashid. So uh, you are one of the consultant on call. You have started your job. Okay, and um, you were called to see a patient. Okay, in the intensive care unit uh, where the intensivists are not happy. Okay, so the patient is a 45 year old uh, male. Okay, who is day three post small bowel resection. Okay, for gangrene bowel. Okay, patient was extubated on table. Okay, and patient was managed in the intensive care unit. Okay, patient is gradually becoming uh, uh, breathlessness, patient developing gradual breathlessness and abdominal distension. Okay, so and the anesthet and the and the intensivists are not happy. Okay, with the patient, so they are asking you to come and assess the patient. So how do you assess this patient? Okay, uh, I will quickly go and see this patient. Uh, I will speak to the anesthetic team and the nursing team taking care of the patient about their concerns. I, I would like to know what the observations are, how much support the patient is needing. Is the patient intubated? 
Mm -hmm. uh, what operation he uh, the patient had, I will go mm -hmm. through the the records, past medical history, operation note, mm -hmm. uh, the medications that patient is on at the moment. Is the patient on any anticoagulation or anotropic support? I would like to know the pulse, blood pressure, urine output, and any other measurements that's being done. Okay, so you go there. Patient is uh, alert. Okay, patient is not intubated. Patient's respiratory rate is around twenty. <clears throat> okay, yeah. and uh, patient is having shortness of breath. Okay. Heart rate is 100, okay? Saturation is 99 with 10 liters of oxygen, okay? And um, his uh, uh, blood pressure is unsupported, 100 by, 9, 100 by 70 millimeters of mercury, okay? His urine output has been gradually coming down in the last uh, six to seven hours, okay? In spite of fluid resuscitation, okay? And his abdomen is distended and tense. Uh, what's the amount of fluid that he had in the last 24 hours? So he has he has received like four liters of fluid. Okay, okay. So despite fluid res resuscitation, his uh, urine output is going down. So I should be concerned about uh, any any renal cause, just because he's a post-op patient. I'd, I'd like to rule out any any cause of pre-renal failure. Mm -hmm. uh, other other reasons for uh, decreased urine output. Uh, one of the commonly missed cause is a blockade of the of the catheter. So mm -hmm. I'll check that the catheter is not blocked. Mm -hmm. uh, if if the blood pressure is okay and and uh, and the patient is, is the CVP of the patient is good. So I think uh, the other reason will be intraabdominal hypertension that might lead to uh, the decreased urine output. Mm -hmm. So I will make sure that the patient's uh, uh, intraabdominal pressure has been monitored. If not, then I will request a CDL monitoring of the uh, of the intraabdominal pressure. But along with that, I, will, I would also give a fluid bolus challenge. Fine. So of, how do how do you measure the intraabdominal pressure? The intraabdominal pressure can be monitored uh, can be measured by uh, passing a catheter, mm -hmm. a Foley's catheter, uh, inflating mm -hmm. uh, and instilling around 20, uh, 25 mL of fluid. Uh, there is a transducer which is uh, which is placed at at the level of the pubic symphysis, and it's zero to that. Uh, after 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 inst instilling around 20, 25 mL of fluid in the bladder, that the pressure is is recorded by the transducer. Okay, fine. So the you patient is supine. You, yeah. Yeah. You ask this uh, uh, for the staff to do, and they say that the the intraabdominal pressure is twenty two. Okay, so I would I would inquire uh, whether whether the patient had any vomiting when did when did he open his bowels? Is he opening his bowels or not? Uh, so he has been the... kept nil by mouth for the last three days okay. and has an NG so, in place. Okay, so my uh, my my con just because it's it's one off reading, I I would I would like more uh, reading just to just to monitor it before intervening. So the intervention that's going in my mind will be to put an NG tube to decompress the stomach. To, uh, to put a rectal catheter, or if possible, I will speak to the gastroenterologist to uh, to do a, a endoscopy, endoscopic decompression if needed. Why do you want to do an endoscopic decompression? Uh, to, uh, to decrease the intraabdominal pressure. How can they do that? Uh, they, they can- so how, many uh, times, how many times an abdominal compartment syndrome is secondary to ileus or distended or the dilated bowels? Uh, it's, it's not very, not very common. So yeah, so I, I would like to take this answer back. I will I will, rec I will request further I'll, I'll request further scans to look mm -hmm. for any intraabdominal cause of of the intraabdominal hypertension. Okay, fine. Yeah. So you do an a CT scan which is showing some moderate free fluid, okay, and some edematous bowel loops and a mesenteric stranding, okay, and you don't find any massive collection to drain or anything, okay. okay. So what are all the ways? you hmm. will manage this patient. Okay, so uh, I'll make sure the pa patient has got an NG, NG decompression. Mm -hmm. uh, I will make sure patient is not in any pain. Mm -hmm. um, so adequate analgesia has been provided. I mm -hmm. will ask the IT team to give him some muscle relaxant. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I, and I will I will continue with monitoring of the urine output and in, serial intraabdominal pressure monitoring. Okay, so how will you how will you class what is meant by an abdominal compartment syndrome? How will you define that? So abdominal compartment syndrome is increased in intraabdominal pressure. Uh, uh, it, it's pressure more uh, pressure more than twenty millimeters of Hg with new onset uh, organ failure. Very good. Okay, so how will you classify intraabdominal hypertension? 
So intraabdominal hypertension is classified uh, as pressure in, into class one, two, three, and four. So any pressure more than 12 millimeter of Hg, 12 to 15 is class one, 15 to 20 is class two, 21 to 25 is three, any, anything more than 25 is four. Right. right, okay. So you are managing this patient in this way, okay, for the 24 hours, he is okay, okay, he's holding on. Next day you're going and seeing his wound is completely wet. What will you do? Uh, so uh, this patient, this patient, because of intra-abdominal hypertension, might be uh, developing a wound dehiscence. Mm -hmm. So I I will open the dressing. Uh, uh, if if they, they are sutures, I will release the suture because the uh, because it's oozing. If they are clips, I will I will remove it and try to try to uh, release all the collection that's in there. Just to make sure there's no there is no there is no source of any infection. Will you do that in the situation or you will do anything else? What will happen if you open the clips in the situation? Uh, so in intraabdominal hypertension, that will that will give rise to burst abdomen. Yeah. So if you if you open the clips, when you whatever stitch or clips which you remove, won't it reduce the uh, the tension in the abdominal wall and it won't it give away completely? Now, my, my, my main concern why I removed the clip was, was there any, any abscess that's causing the problem? Because how, will it, four... how will you differentiate whether it's a wound infection or it's an abdominal wound dehiscence, clinically by looking at the wound? So th there should be surrounding erythema, erythema mm -hmm. and, the, the, and the, there's, there should be redness and erythema in the surrounding skin, plus the mm -hmm. white cell count CRP should be going up with wound mm -hmm. infection. Anything else? What specific feature you will look for which will tell that this could be a burst abdomen and not wound infection. There's no pus coming out, will rule out wound infection. Yes, pus won't, no pus will come out, but what will come out? Serous fluid. What kind of serous fluid? I'll, I'll pass on that. That's fine. Right. Okay. So you think that the wound is giving away, okay? And uh, you feel that you strongly believe that the the patient is uh, going to give away. Okay, how are you going to manage the situation? Uh, so, th this uh, if the patient is conscious, I'll explain to the patient. Uh, my my main main priority will be to decrease the intraabdominal pressure, and uh, that can be done by doing a laparostomy. Mm -hmm. So I'll consider the patient for that. If if possible, I will speak to the relatives of the patient, the anesthetic team, and the ITU consultant, and I'll take the patient to theater after the proper consenting. Okay. So imagine if the same patient doesn't have an abdominal compartment syndrome, okay, but you are seeing this pinkish fluid, okay, and you you and and gradually you see that you put your finger on the skin and you see that the rectus sheath is given away, and you open a clip and you see bowel inside. Okay. okay, it has not come out yet. How will you manage? So uh, th this is abdominal dehiscence, mm -hmm. and uh, the main, main main priority will be to protect the bowel because mm -hmm. high chances of uh, of fistulating and bowel injury. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I, I will I will uh, uh, if available, I will put a paraffin gauze mm -hmm. uh, on on the bowel and and uh, and cover it with a wet swab. Mm -hmm. uh, I I will. I will remove any uh, any metallic clips which are which are close to the bowel, mm -hmm. and uh, depending so you remove on the metallic clips now, the bowel loop has come out now. Okay, so uh, depending upon how the patient is hemodynamically, if the patient is stable, I will manage this wound with a wound manager, because that, uh, tr tr any attempt of closing uh, this wound will lead to lead to cut through of the stitches, and it won't hold. So the best way to, uh, in my opinion, in my practice is to manage these wounds with uh, a, a wound manager. So what is wound manager and why is it designed for? What is it designed for? So How many wound... times in your clinical practice you had used a wound manager for an abdominal dehiscence? So wound managers are, be, are mainly used for fistulas. Mm -hmm. So if, if, there's, if there's open fistula and pa patient is not fit enough for any surgery, yeah. so... The, those cases are managed best with the wound manager. So what is the point in putting a wound manager when the intact bowel loop is protruding out? Mm. 
it will it it will it will protect the bowel it will allow the granulation tissue to to uh, get on the surface of the bowel in few days yeah. how come a wound manager can do that wound manager is just a stoma bag isn't it yeah so it it will, it will prevent desiccation Mm -hmm. To prevent desiccation of the bowel and any any other st uh, uh, stuff that we keep on the bowel will will cause ad adherence and changing that will lead to fistulation. But these can be prevented with the help of wound manager. Fine. Okay. So you, you do an elective laparotomy for some case. Okay. How yeah. will you close the abdomen? How will you close the sheath? So for elect elective laparotomy, I I use uh, PDS loop PDS sutures. Mm -hmm. So times two. And mm -hmm. I, I start uh, one from the one from the top and one from the bottom end. Mm -hmm. I I take bites at one centimeter away from the wound of the rect sheath margin and one one centimeter below. So that's how I close it. What is your view on using tiny sutures and tiny bites? So short stitch trial has shown that it it has uh, reduced uh, the risk of incisional hernia. Uh, I I have practiced it for some time, mm. but uh, it it hasn't got uh, the out the outcome it, 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 there's not much drastic change in the outcome with the short stitch or the normal stitches. There's another okay. stitch that we know about is the Hughes closure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So ag again, it hasn't shown much uh, uh, benefit uh, compared to the conventional closure, mass closure. Fine. So, so what do you understand by the term retention sutures in burst abdomen? So retention sutures are tension tension sutures. So mm -hmm. uh, these these sutures are used to support the normal normal suturing that we do. These these sutures are specially made, and they have got a tubing around it, which prevents the cut through to the wounds. Fine, we'll stop here. Okay. Yeah. Good. You did very well, man. You did very well. Okay. You did again. The presence of mind. Means obviously, uh, I'm I'm. You are answering to me for the first time. Uh, obviously, I can say that you have a reasonable experience in surgery, obviously. Yeah. So, and a um, few things which I want to tell you is, uh, as you rightly told in the exam, when you say, that is, we, we, we all tend to tell wrong answers, okay, in the exam. And uh, obviously, the examiner will tell you the clue that it is wrong, okay. But majority of the candidates, what they will feel is, uh, they try to justify, they know that they have told the wrong answer, but they'll try to justify the wrong answer in a different way and they end up in trouble. There is no harm in telling that, sorry, my response is wrong. I would take, I would like to take back and this is the response which I want to give. Okay. okay. So that, that, that is the way you need to answer. And um, you did very well in, in high order thinking, thinking of all the possibilities which could happen in the patient. You rightly picked up, it could be an intraabdominal hypertension. You told very clearly how the uh, abdominal pressures are measured, um, which is all good. Uh, one thing is, how will you differentiate the, the typical feature of an evolving burst abdomen is basically you, the wound will be extremely soaked than the regular wound infection. And you will see a pinkish serous fluid draining out of the wound, pinkish serous fluid. Okay. And whenever, so how, how you can assess a wound which is dehazing or not is obviously when you see the, the skin will be stretching, the skin will be stretched that you won't see. So in an infection, you will have erythema, but in the burst, it will be stretched. Okay. And you can put your finger on the skin to see if there is a gapping in the rectus sheath. Okay? okay. Or sometimes if there is a given away in the skin, you can see if the bowel is seen or not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now you did everything well, but one thing which is not good is using a wound manager for a burst abdomen. Okay. So okay. then when there is a burst or an evolving burst okay your aim is to protect the bowel okay obviously yeah. in a complete burst abdomen okay in a complete burst abdomen this patient needs to go to theater when the bowel is seen outside you need to take this patient to theater you try to do whatever you want okay if you can close it try to close it primarily or try to close it and put some tension switches or if you can't close it put an aphthera put a vac and allow it to granulate okay okay if by any chance you go at a stage where the skin is intact, but the rectus sheath is given, the abdomen is soft, and probably you are thinking of some technical uh, issues, and this is happening, say, 14 days or 15 days after the operation, then you have two options. Either you take the patient to theater, try to correct that, or you give an abdominal binder straight away and try to make the skin heal first and allow it to evolve as an incisional hernia, 
and you can operate it later. Okay. Okay. So yeah. the wound manager comes only in very bad uh, infected wounds. Okay. For example, a wound which is leaking. Okay, and which is infected. Obviously, you can put. Okay. A wound manager is not uh, used to protect an exposed bowel. Okay. Okay. That's the one thing which I want to add. And stitch trial, you did very well actually. Okay, and managing uh, how you manage a patient with suspected uh, abdominal hypertension or intra compartment syndrome. Again, compartment syndrome is a very, very common scenario. Okay, yeah. almost every exam you will have one scenario related to it. Okay, yeah. good, right? Thank Fine, you. thank you, mate. Thank you. Right, who else want to answer? Anyone else who wants to answer? Let me let me. Figure out someone who is gone. Um, who is who wants to answer, guys? Anyone else? Muhammad has already answered. Anyone else who has not answered so far? Uh, let me call. Um, uh, Dali Las, you want to answer, sir? Dali. Hello. No, I, I can I can hear a very mild. I can't hear you actually. Hello. Are you hearing me? No, I think you have some voice problem. I think even the last week you had the same problem. Fine. Uh, let me move on. Let me ask uh, Nisha. You want to answer? I can give a try. No, you can. You can. Hear? Yeah, of course I can hear you. Okay, right. Uh, let me find the scenario for you. Okay, fine. So, uh, Anisha, so you are uh, the consultant on call, and you get a patient who is an 84 years old uh, male, okay, uh, presenting with uh, abdominal distension, bilious vomiting, and um, uh, abdominal pain, okay, um, and. Uh, let me show you the picture. And patient was initially seen by your registrar. Um, he has uh, given, started some IV fluids. Patient is hemodynamically stable. And then they did a CT scan. OK? And I'll mm -hmm. show you the CT scan that a minute. Um, can you see? Yes. Yes, what do you see here? This is an axial view of the uh, CT. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I do see um, the liver with, mm -hmm. uh, with some hemo, uh, with some pneumobilia. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, a vague cystic structure, uh, cystic appearance in the within the liver as well. Mm -hmm. Stomach, um, looks normal in appearance, I would mm -hmm. say, with mm -hmm. some with some fluid within it. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, spleen looks all right as well. It's uh, okay. Yeah, so I would like to see. So you you have seen this view. picture. You have seen this picture. Now I'm going to show the next film in the same picture. Let me show you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so um, again, this is a coronal view of the abdomen, mm -hmm. uh, abdominal pelvis. Um, it's, uh, I would say, as per the face of, I can't, I cannot say it's an arterial face. Mm -hmm. um, there is obvious uh, uh, appearance of uh, some bar loops mm -hmm. uh, with the. Um, with nematosis, which mm -hmm. I believe is an early sign of ischemia. Mm -hmm. I don't particularly see any free fluid, uh, mm -hmm. especially in the pelvis, I don't see. Mm -hmm. um, would like to see the arterial phase if it was done to see mm -hmm. if there's any 
the um if the um bowel is enhancing well or is there an obvious ischemia ischemic okay so what what do you think so combining both the uh, images what do you think patient is having now um so it's an elderly gentleman who has come with um, abdominal distension and bilious vomiting mm -hmm. uh, possibly i would like to know whether um uh, he had any previous abdominal surgeries i would like to know uh, uh about his presentation take a focused history um and obviously examine the patient to see whether he is clinically peritonitic look into the vitals um and uh, and so my main suspicion why do you why do you think so okay main suspicion is what my main suspicion here is uh, uh, of uh, bowel ischemia itself mm -hmm. uh, I'm, so I'm why not... do you think patient mm -hmm. with ischemia has uh, air in the bile duct, pneumobilia? Uh, this uh, this can enter via the portal system. Um, uh, when uh, when there is ischemia of the gut, the air does enter via the portal system into the liver. Mm -hmm. Okay. What what else it could be if it is not a uh, um uh, uh pneumobilia what else it could be just with this view which you have shown me mm -hmm. i think if a patient has got a, a, a gallstone which has uh, and has got a um cholecystoentric fistula uh, that also can cause pneumobilia anything else what else can have the same picture within the liver uh, patient I'm telling that I am telling that there is no gas in the biliary system in this patient. I see. Um, sepsis. No. So patient this is this is this is a ga gas in the portal vein. Portal vein. It's, yes. Not. Yeah. Not so nemo. Yeah, sorry. This is. This is a gas in the portal vein, portal, yeah. secondary to. Um, ischemia of the small bowel okay so what are you going to how are you going to treat this patient so um i would uh, assess the patient with the crisp protocol looking mm -hmm. to the um emphasizing on a b c d e take a detailed focus history from the patient um uh first of all is he awake alert uh, to give me a history, if not take collateral history from the relatives, uh, any any previous abdominal surgeries, any evidence of any um, uh, after. Uh, Fine. So you you do all these things. You do all these things. You have started on antibiotics. Um, uh, you have discussed with the. So you have done a CT scan. So what in the CT scan uh, will make you think that this patient would need a laparotomy? Will you take this patient to laparotomy or not? Um, again it uh, there are several factors to look into um patient's uh, performance status um has also a role the age he's an elderly gentleman as well mm -hmm. uh whether you imagine he, the patient is uh, a good elderly man with okay. a good functional reserve um obviously i'll start with resuscitating the patient mm -hmm. uh, if a broad spectrum antibiotics take all all, their... all, are, all are done how are you going to decide whether you are going to operate this patient or you are going to manage conservatively is there a role of conservative management in this case how will you know that this is an arterial gangrene or a venous gangrene of the small bowel hmm. okay um i will look into lactate um yeah. look into the blood picture well, how, will, how, how can it tell whether it is an arterial gangrene or venous gangrene based on the blood picture? Okay. Um, I would do a triple phase CT. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that's the only way I can say whether it's arterial or venous gangrene. So, what, what, what in the triple phase CT will tell that, say, it is an arterial ischemia? The um, I. I mean, um, either SMA, depending on the area where the where the per hypoperfusion is. So it could mm -hmm. be up into uh, the celiac SMA and IMA where, mm -hmm. uh, region in itself, 
uh, if there is at least two vessel, uh, if two vessel is uh, is intact, then there is a less chance that uh, uh, this is arterial ischemia. Um, but um, that's one. If that if the arteries, how, how will you, how will you know that it's a venous ischemia then? There would be uh, some thrombosis. I would see in the venous uh, um, venous. Um, uh, Veins, yeah, the mesenteric veins. veins. Yes, mesenteric veins, yes. So, how do you, how, based on the uh, uh, look of the bowel in the CT scan, how will an arterial ischemic bowel look in a CT scan, and the venous ischemic venous gangrene of the small bowel look in a CT scan? Just tell about the bowel difference between the arterial and the venous ischemia. Um. In the arterial ischemia, in the arterial phase, um, as the ischemic part, ischemic bulb would be hypo or almost non-perfused. Mm -hmm. uh, but in 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 a in a venous ischemia, there is more of congestion rather than uh, rather than uh, yeah congestion edema these features would be more so the ball would be quite uh, edematous yeah, uh, yeah. plus would see some uh, uh, some um, um, air within the within the mesentery and of, as as in this picture uh, in the portal circulation fine so how is the what's the key difference in the management of an arterial is bowel ischemia and the venous bowel ischemia so the venous ischemia can be managed uh, with with anticoagulation mm -hmm. um, or um, arterial ischemia needs 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 again it depends on where the ischemia where the where the um, uh, which which uh, is it the main main branch of SMA main origin of SMA uh, or if whether it's very peripheral um, is peripheral um, thrombosis of the arteries uh, mesenteric arteries depending on that uh, you could go for uh, um, interventional procedures as well um, to stent. Uh, you can use fine. you can okay fine we will we will stop here okay so basically again venous ischemia is the arterial ischemia so if the bowel is dead you know you need to operate whatever it is okay whether it's a venous ischemia or this one and how will you know that the bowel is dead is obviously looking in a ct scan whether uh, if there is obvious nematosis involving the bowel wall most likely the bowel is dead okay if there's no nematosis and if the if the if there if there is no enhancement of the bowel and still it could be dead or it could be dying okay um if if there is some enhancement in the bowel then those are the situations where you can manage conservatively uh, a venous uh, ischemia usually is managed with anticoagulation while the arterial ischemia or an abdominal angina where there is the patient just presents with abdominal pain with no um, evidence of uh, dead gut we start we manage the patient with antiplatelets okay so again uh, uh, ischemia of the small bowel or the, the gangrene, the, the, the venous ischemia or the arterial ischemia of the small bowel is one of the very common scenarios which you can expect in uh, critical care. Okay. So, uh, but you did well. Okay. You did well. You, you, you have, means your thought process is good. Your knowledge is good. Uh, of course, you have uh, some difficulties in producing the answers, which is extremely common, very, very common. Almost everyone has uh, this problem when we start, but overall, your knowledge is good. Thinking of whatever the op whatever is the next uh, line of management. Good. Any any questions? Any questions so far? So I think again we have discussed quite a lot of scenarios today in critical care. Obviously, you would have uh, means again. I try to keep the critical care scenario very simple because this is the first. Uh, exposure uh, for the scenarios for you. Now, usually, so most scenarios if you had seen today, these are all straightforward scenarios. Okay, a patient had surgery, abdominal distension, uh, burst abdomen, or uh, abdominal compartment syndrome. Okay, but usually in the exams, you, you will have three or four scenarios or four problems 
club together okay a patient with previous coronary artery disease having a stent had underwent a ischemic bowel operation now presenting with breathlessness and abdominal distension this is how they will ask or a patient who has uh, um, uh, allergies to various medications is coming to the hospital um, for an elective inguinal hernia repair um, uh, with the background of uh, a family history of connective tissue disorder so this is how complex the scenarios are uh, made in the actual uh, exams but the thing you need to understand is whatever scenario it is you need to follow the basic principles okay for any critical if it is a trauma you follow an atls principle uh, for the um, uh, critically unwell patient you follow a crisp crisp protocol and you go step by step step by step uh, and then obviously the examiner will guide you the most important thing is whenever uh, you have a critical care situation you you should not go with the scenario on the patient's findings but you need to think globally okay a patient with breathlessness in the thing you need to tell i am concerned the possible differential diagnosis or the medical causes are this 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 is the surgical causes are this 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 so i'll go there i'll get history i'll try to rule out all the possible medical causes and surgical causes this is how you need to approach uh, any scenario but overall you know to be very honest being a first session i don't know whether you had practice before or whether you had experience or not but whoever answered today you you all did uh, very well for a first time presentation okay means I, I i accept the fact that the scenarios were um, very straightforward and simple but the way you answered is all very very good uh, and uh, i'm pretty sure that if you are a candidate giving the september exam you are a very very strong candidate i would say yeah good any questions if not we can wind off the session today no okay if you have no further questions probably we will meet next week for hpb okay um scenarios on hpb we will discuss next week uh, and in the meantime uh, again uh, try i mean uh, any questions or any queries uh, please put up in the group and candidates who have already uh, registered for the course um uh, uh, we will discuss in the group separately uh, and do let us do uh, let your friends know about the course um, and if you have any candidates who are interested or giving exams this september um, uh, and if they want to join a course still we have few seats uh, left and we can offer that okay and uh, if anyone any of your can colleagues wants to know how the viva exam is you can request them to join for the next session so they will have some experience on it okay good thank you so much yes, thank you thank you thank you Mike. no problem bye thank bye you. bye bye thank you bye